Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves episode eight. Um, it's actually it's our um, interview episode which we do on every Thursday, and I'm here with Tim Wilms, um, our co-editor in chief. Hello. Um, hello, Tim. And I'm also here with the national president of the Firearm Owners United um, group, and he's James Buckle. Um, welcome, James. Good day, gents. Thanks for having me on the show. It's our pleasure. Um, so the Firearms Firearm Owners United is Australia's newest firearm lobby group. Now the thing is, we are not exactly firearm owners, but we do consider ourselves to be an ally of people who are firearm owners because um, we want to make sure that they have the freedom to actually um, use their firearms. Um, now the thing is, James. So how did you come to owning a firearm and actually shooting um, as a hobby? Um, I grew up in Hong Kong, and over there, obviously, firearms being in China are quite illegal. But what was really huge over there was uh, airsoft, uh, the old BB guns with, they look like real guns. We used to have a couple of, um, we basically used to do paintball style, and we used to shoot each other with those as a bit of a sport. Um, I left that behind when I moved to Australia, and I've always been interested in hunting and the mechanical function of firearms and the like. So um, once, once I was uh, able to, uh, I simply applied for my license and got into target shooting, got into hunting, and yeah, just sort of grew my knowledge and expertise from there. Yes. Okay, so you said you moved from Hong Kong. Yes, um, that's right. So that means their laws are a bit more lax than Australia? Well, no, no, because you can't own a firearm, okay. but in... Australia, airsoft is banned, which is the BB gun things they have in Hong Kong. So, okay. no, no, our laws are definitely much more relaxed. But over there, what, that, what over there, the airsoft is like considered just a child's toy because realistically, it's what it is. Um, but over here, it's it's over here, it's like um, it's fully prohibited. Although there are um, a couple of efforts from states such as South Australia to actually get that legalised as a sport, much in the same vein as paintball. Yep. So we'll t we've talked a bit about your background. So we're interested to know about uh, well, yeah, the organisation uh, that you had, Firearm Owners United, which was only formed quite recently, but it's but it's gained a significant following. You have over forty thousand uh, fans on. On Facebook, and you're getting in, uh, getting into a lot of a lot of media. Um, you've got your own line of merchandise now, and uh, so so you're getting quite quite a lot of uh, publicity as well. Uh, so yeah, we'd just like to talk about uh, ask you about why you decided why the organisation was started, and are you surprised with uh, its its popularity in such a short space of time? Well, I'll start by addressing the first question. Uh, Firearm Owners United uh, was started up by me, by myself one day, um, when I heard that the then Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, and members of the Liberal Party were planning on banning uh, a new, and I put the term loosely, a new model of uh, lever-action shotgun. Now, lever-action shotguns have been in Australia for well, well over 100 years. Um, after 1996, once certain types of firearms, namely pump-action shotguns and all types of semi-automatic rifles, were placed into a much more highly restrictive category, um, being that I'd say 90% of Australian shooters can't actually own, um, lever-action shotguns were, you know, they weren't seen as an issue, so to speak. Um, all of a sudden, despite the fact that no crime has ever been committed with one, you have um, the politics of fear coming into play, saying, oh, this is going to lead to another Port Arthur. Imagine yeah. if Man, Man Mahonis in Sydney had a, had a, a lever-action shotgun, which, you know, he had a pump-action shotgun, which does have a, a slightly different rate of fire, but, you know, it all comes down to operator. Uh, anyway, so basically, once I heard that, I started a petition, um, just one of those little casual internet petitions on... Uh, change.org and used used that to sort of raise awareness that it was happening. I think within the first week it hit about 5,000 signatures and 
eventually ended up with 15,000. And basically, I started up a Facebook page, which I called Firearm Owners United, to sort of push that petition. And it sort of evolved from there, from being just a petition to uh, recruiting like-minded people from all across the country to help me run this page. And now we've found ourselves in the position where we think that we're ready to take it beyond social media, which we have been doing, um, and going on from there. So it's been a pretty interesting journey. Uh, it's been a bit of fun, and it's been a bit uh, teeth gnashing at times, listening to some of the stuff that the mainstream media and uh, generally uneducated politicians and certainly those who are educated who have their own agendas um, spew out their strange and virulent and Australian rhetoric. So, yeah, it's, it's been a journey, and it's still going, and it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be good fun continuing it. Um, now we did um, touch on the status of guns in Australia, and Australia is seen as um, an example of, let's say, successful gun control. Um, mm -hmm. um, and our media and our politicians are extremely anti-gun, um, and they actually use mass shootings in America to, to sort of prove their point. You know, they use mass shootings to actually demonstrate. Yeah, yeah the dangers of gun ownership. Um, do you think we can change that sort of anti-gun culture in Australia and also people's perceptions of guns in Australia? I think it's certainly possible. And th these kind of things do require a lot of time. They require a lot of groundwork. This has been going on, uh, well, it's been going on since 1996, 1997. And yeah. even before that, I mean, the first sort of bans that we had on firearms in the country I believe were back in the 1920s where pistols and rifles capable of accepting uh, ammunition that the military use were banned uh, for, funnily enough, for fear of communist uprising, which is <laughs> which is a whole different conversation that we may have yep. another time. But um, so it, it has been going on for a while. But what people need to remember is that you know we're not we're not the United States. It's a false dichotomy to compare us to it. Um, you know. There are plenty of other Western liberal democracies and other nations with far more liberal firearm laws in Australia that have lower or equivalent violent crime per capita homicide rates. I mean, you never see these people mention New Zealand, Canada, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, even to a slight extent, the United Kingdom. They have, I'd probably say we're on par, but they have some laws that are less strict and ones that are way more, for example, in Australia, you can own a revolver or a semi-automatic pistol for sports shooting. In the United Kingdom, you can't. Not even the Olympic team can. They have to go to France to train, which is okay. Pretty. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, if if we look at New Zealand, for example, uh, over there, you go through your licensing process. It's very similar to how you do it here. You also have an interview with a police officer who just sort of susses you out and sees if you're you know, sort of the right person who should be owning a firearm. Um, that's obviously open to interpretation, but I don't really see, I, I haven't really heard of any examples uh, recently where someone's just been denied because the cop doesn't like them. Um, and once they have that, um, you know, they can essentially buy almost any firearm they'd like. Uh, they've got semi-automatic rifles, uh, semi-automatic shotguns, pump action shotguns, uh, a whole host of, um, you can actually even apply for a special collector's license to own fully automatic firearms. And this is in New Zealand. This is in America. This is, this is you know, the guys who make up the name of Anzac, who are literally over the water from us. Um, so it's very interesting to sort of see how they've gone. Even though they did have a massacre in 1997, it was clear at the time that the government decided that they were going to treat the rest of the people like normal law-abiding citizens rather than going, okay, we're just going to blanket ban everything, which seems to be the Australian mentality, which is pretty sad. Yeah. What, what, yeah, what do you see is the biggest problem with Australia's uh, current uh, firearms regulations? Uh, 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 what, uh, what would you see like to change, change, change ultimately? Well, for the listeners at home, we do have our website, which... Um, I'm sure the boys will put up later on. We do have a link to the policy that we'd like to see. But um, some of the things that we would like to see just on the off chance are a complete rollback of what the laws are essentially, uh, put the power back into the states for the, um, and give them 
the ability to make up their own mind. This whole national firearms agreement thing is a farce. We already have different states that allow different types of firearms. For example, New South Wales allows revolving rifles. Uh, does not allow revolving rifles, rather, but Victoria does. So, I mean, there's already a disparity there, so so much for the NFA. Um, what we'd like to see is um, semi-automatic firearms, uh, rifles, shotguns, and pump-action shotguns uh, returned back into the hands of people who, are, who have already been licensed and vetted by the police. Obviously, you know, they're not going to be going out and randomly shooting up a school. If they wanted to, they could do it with anything they had lying around. I mean, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean if we look at if we look at China, which has huge amounts of gun control, um, you know, they've got people like going out on knife massacres and killing, you know, tens of people. So yes, it, 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 it all comes down to the, the person. It's not it's not so much the item, which is why the owner should be placed on licensing the person, not the item. If I was suddenly granted an AR-15, which I would like to own in the future uh, to conduct sporting shooting and, you know, maybe a bit of hunting on the side. I mean, if I can go out and go get a license for a semi-automatic concealable handgun, yet I can't go do the same thing for a rifle. I mean, like, where's the logic in that? It just, it just doesn't make sense. All that we want to see is common sense laws. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what 90% of the Australian uh, Republic wants anyway, common sense laws, regardless of whatever it is. So we want to try and inject a bit of logic into the debate. Um, we don't want to get angry and demand things, but at the same time, we don't want to step down from our position. So once we've got an established member base and once we're you know, properly rooted, it'll be a lot harder to ignore us. So we'll see what happens from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the next question we had. So yeah, obviously we talked about the the popularity of uh, of the the Facebook page of Firearm Owners United. So uh, do you do you see a lot of optimism with like, especially with young people that attitudes can yeah. be changed? Absolutely, absolutely. We find that the majority of the people who follow our page are generally. I believe it's somewhere in the 40% bracket um, for people who are 19 to 35, which I'd consider you know, to be young or upcoming young people. Um, and those people are definitely the ones who have sat back and gone, well, hang on a minute. Why can't I own this? Why can't I do this? What's the reason? Okay, so some dude committed a crime 20 years ago, but that's my fault? Why is that? And, you know, you'll find that because social media and the internet's out there, people do a lot of research themselves and they tend to go, well, there are other countries that have this. Why can't I? And, you know, that all comes down to proper networking and how effective that we can uh, make their voices. So uh, I, I do see change happening in the foreseeable future. Uh, we do have... A couple of lines with you know, politicians and um, you know certain state police uh, commissioners who have said, you know, they don't support further restrictions being placed. And you know, for that, that's that, that's take an example of um, you guys know what a suppressor is, yeah, you know, the thing that you put on the end of a end of a firearm and it, it um, softens the noise so it's not bad for your ears. Oh yes. Well, yeah, we've heard well, of it, we've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we know what it is. <laughs> you would have seen them in movies where, yeah, where, yeah. where it's literally silent. That's not true at all. It, like, reduces it by, like, 30 to... Okay, well, I don't know the proper stats because each suppressor is different, but it reduces the volume uh, of the shot um, to the point where you don't necessarily need to wear hearing protection or double hearing protection, depending on what you have. Now, the United Kingdom, uh, America, obviously, uh, Czech Republic, New Zealand... They all have suppressors. Crimes are just not committed with them. Yet over here, you have fear-mongering articles come out um, saying that you know, criminals are using suppressors. I'm like, well, please show me like 10 examples of criminals are using suppressors. Criminals are using firearms as a status system. Criminals are doing drive-bys where they want it to be loud to cause fear. No one's using a suppressor. What a load of shit. <laughs> it's, um... yeah. <clears throat> yeah, James... 
the thing is, that's a good point because our next question actually is about um, questions that those anti-gun advocates ask people. So, you know, those questions that are fueled by that fear mong fear-mongering. And wow. yeah, so my favorite. Like, <laughs> yeah. So they usually ask things like, you know, why do you have to have shooting as a hobby? Um, because, you know, guns can kill ultimately. So why do you have to have shooting as a hobby um, given the actual nature of guns? Well, you have to realize that shooting is a very, very cultural thing. It, it's, it stems back from, from hunting, which we've done. Yeah, I agree, like, yeah. And it, it was, it, it, we then moved on to archery and then moved on to firearms. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say firearms are solely designed to kill. I mean, yeah. I have a custom-built target rifle that its literal only use is to shoot pieces of paper at 25 meters. So it all comes down to the person. Now, if someone says to me, why do you need a gun? I say, well, I, I need a gun for hunting so I can ethically harvest my game, my free range mates. I mean, I like to see you go and do that. Um, I enjoy doing target shooting because I consider it a, a, sk a skill. I consider it a, a good bit of fun. I consider it uh, a social uh, sport as well. You're not going to the range generally by yourself. There's always people there. Um, it's 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 a, it's a skill. You know, it's it's just something that if you don't do it, like people just don't really understand. Like there's nothing wrong with me owning a rifle and going to the range and taking up shooting. I enjoy it. Yeah. The same way someone might enjoy golf or driving a car or any other sort of sport. I mean, who who are these people to say you should not do this? I mean, go away. Like I don't tell you how to live your life. Don't tell me how to live mine. Particularly when exactly. particularly yeah. when there's a very high chance that you've never even touched or seen a firearm in the flesh yes. other than on a police officer or something so it's yeah a, i mean a, the, the yeah. thing is I, as in i i get that because you know we do have that cultural argument and the modern day sort of left-wing progressives they reject the cultural factors of our society and they do use that to attack gun owners um and you know they they, they say things like can you enjoy more harmless hobby for everyone's safety you know that's just a very shallow question isn't it yeah, I mean, like the, the 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 projection that they have, like they don't they don't trust themselves with the firearm deep down because they're you know, delusional. Yeah, like yeah. Ge generally, generally like all communists. But um, <laughs> yeah, well, and it, 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 again, it comes down to their restrictive mindset, their their obsession with the nanny state, their obsession with the need for big government. Like it's not it's not something that surprisingly everyone actually wants. And if people want to go out and enjoy themselves um, using firearms in a safe and responsible manner, it, it's really no one's business. There are 1.2 something million and rising firearm owners in Australia. If we were an issue, people would know about it. Exactly. I mean, how, how often do you hear about some bloke going out and just shooting someone? who is actually a licensed owner, how often does that happen? It hardly happens. Yet the way that they construct their argument um, makes you believe that these sort of things happen all the time. It's it's absolutely insane. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, if you compare the... If you compare, sorry, sorry, Tim. Yeah. If you compare the cor correlations, you know, I mean, in many places that do have guns, as you said earlier, they don't really have mass shootings. I mean, the, the more free, freedom there is in terms of gun control, you know, the less shootings there are, as you mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a very flawed argument, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look at America, which I, I did say before, let's not look at America as an example, but there are shootings that occur in America. Now, if we look at from, this is from the FBI's statistics uh, from 2015. If we look at actual shootings that happen, you find that 70% of those are suicide. Now, as we yeah. know, in, as we know in Australia, when the 1996 buyback happened, the suicides with a firearm dropped. But guess what? Suicide by other methods, methods rose. <laughs> actually rose above uh, what was um, what was there originally. So anyway, once you've taken that out of the picture, you're looking at the other 30% of deaths, I think... Accidental very, ones. Oh, well, you, you, yeah. there, are, there are accidents, but we're looking at a majority of those, the rest of that 30% are actually committed with illegal firearms in gang violence in the US. Oh, okay. So 
all these people who go, oh, yeah, the U.S. had, you know, 25,000 gun deaths. I'm like, yeah, cool. Well, that's obviously not a nice thing, but let's take away 70% of those suicides. Those people more than likely would have killed themselves via other methods in the first place. Now let's take away the gang violence. And what are you left with? You're, You're left with, like... Like, like ten percent of something that you can't really. It, they're all statistical anomalies, and the U.S. has like three hundred and thirty plus million people. Like, do you think like ten percent of twenty thousand deaths is even like statistical, like significant? No, it's not. It's horrible, but it shouldn't have any policy. Uh, it shouldn't have any bearing on policy, particularly on policy in Australia as well. The politics of fear that the left and you know, even the centrist people and even some right-wing people like to do, um, using the US as an example for why Australians need more gun control or we need to keep the level of gun control as it is, um, it's just wrong. These people don't look into the statistics, or they do and they don't care. It's all its all politics. It's all uh, politics and fear uh, It's It's difficult uh, when it's a, it's a bipartisan uh, policy in Australia to keep uh, the current uh, gun control uh, regime. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's definitely an effort. If we, and another thing is, let's say for example that either party decided that they weren't going to adopt that stance. If we look at, you know, how closely um, tied Labor and the coalition are. Uh, in Parliament, they would stand to lose votes. I mean, let's say that Liberal had like a, an eighty percent majority. They probably wouldn't be hurt so much if they adopted a. Ah, oh, we might like loosen one or two restrictions, but we're definitely not going to bring any more in. Um, it probably wouldn't hurt them that much. So, again, it's all politics. It's looking for the right time. I mean, as we saw with the election, someone coming out and saying we're going to ban lever action shotguns. You know, it's, it makes the community safer. People just sit back and hear. Oh, yeah, cool. We need to ban guns because it makes the community safer. Yeah, I'm voting for these guys. It's all politics. It's all politics. And it's not fair that the 1.2 million Australians who are licensed to own firearms get the short end of the stick from it. So uh, we'll see what we'll see what future elections sort of uh, come out with. If we look at the very, very recent uh, by election in Orange in New South Wales, uh, you'll find that that was a very, very safe national seat. And yeah. it just suffered a 50% swing against it from the Fish, Shooters, yeah. Fishers and Farmers Party. So, you know, we might see that in the future. We might see um, the coalition getting punished in the rural areas from people who do own a lot of firearms. And, um, you know, we'll see. It'll be a very interesting political space at the end of 2018. So we'll see what happens there. Um, we have obviously a lot of work to do in the meantime. <laughs> So um, our next question is also uh, another one that's put, put, put to you by the, the gun control advocates. So a lot of them say, OK, I accept people's right to own guns, but why do you need a semi-automatic uh, military-style <coughs> assault weapon that, which can kill many in uh, minutes? Well, my answer to that is, can you please define what an assault weapon is? Yes. <laughs> it was a deliberately loaded question. Yeah, and they go, oh well, you know, it's it's one of those, and you're like, oh, what an AR-15 semi-automatic? No, an assault. For the viewers at home who may not know, uh, an assault weapon is a made-up term. There is no such thing as an assault weapon um, in the context that it's used in. An assault rifle is a rifle chambered in an intermediate cartridge, so not a super heavy hitting round but not a super light round, just sort of a, an average mid, midfielder, uh, capable of selective fire. That is, you can change it from single shot, semi-auto. So you pull the trigger once and you hold it there, nothing's going to happen. So you have to keep pulling the trigger, so it's semi-auto. And you can change between that and fully automatic, where you hold the trigger down and the weapon fires and bullets keep coming out until you either run out of ammo or stop pulling the trigger. Now... I look around the Australian shooting community and I don't really see many people saying, hey, let's have fully automatics. Personally, I would really have an issue with it. I mean, 
there are lots of old collector's weapons like Bren guns or MG42s or something. I have oh. no issue with a collector owning those or something. Well, fully automatic weapons, they're not legal in the United States even, aren't they? Well, no, they are actually. Um, in the US, they have what's called the machine gun registry, which was opened until 1986, which means that there are firearms floating around um, that are capable of fully automatic fire, which are obviously serialized, registered to uh, a trust, uh, generally, or a specific person. And obviously you can transfer those between different trusts and different people, much like you'd sell a normal firearm, that are capable of fully automatic fire. Uh, for example, um, you might find an old Mac 10, which is, you know, the one that looks like a big T and it's got a big magazine out the bottom of it. Anyway, you might find one of those for sale for like $15,000 and it will be in shit condition. So you can still legally buy fully automatic firearms in the US. Um, but guess what? Guess how many crimes are committed with those legally owned ones? None. <laughs> there, there is not. There is not. There is not actually one recorded instance of that happening. Oh, so, oh, fifteen thousand dollars—that's that's quite a lot of money for a weapon. Yeah, well, well, you should see some of the stuff you can buy, man. Like even just <laughs> even here, you can buy a, like a bolt action rifle here for like hundred thousand bucks. Twelve. But, yeah, well, that, that's generally like your big game African sort of stuff. It's pretty cool. I have a guy who likes <laughs> that um, sort of thing. But yeah, like I said, um, fully automatics are legal in the US, contrary to popular belief, and New Zealand, and the Czech Republic. So, yeah, um, it's not really, it's not really something they can say. Yeah, and um, we mentioned um, how the anti-gun um, advocates sort of um, use logical fallacies a lot, and given that there are constant mass shootings in America, um, isn't it sort of a fallacy for them to argue that all the so the guns can be stopped by a good guy because they seem to argue that a good guy can come about and sort of stop all the violence. It, isn't that a logical fallacy? Don't, don't you think? I mean, particularly considering the fact that most most gun shootings aren't even committed by the legal gun yeah. owners, really. Well, you'll you'll also find, firstly, that contrary to media belief, there aren't actually a lot of mass shootings in America, and also you have to understand what constitutes as a mass shooting. Originally, it was four or more people who were killed. Then it became three or more people who were killed. I believe now it's three or more people who were injured. So there was a website going around a while ago that surfaced up on Reddit, of all places. Um, it was an interactive map. Every time there was a uh, mass shooting in America, it used to pop up. Now, what it didn't show was the fact that some of these were defensive uses, some of these were police officers shooting, some of these were kids shooting each other with BB guns, which aren't actually real guns. Yeah. Uh, some of them were, uh, like, a lot of them, and I mean the vast majority of them, were gang-related shootings. So take all that out of the equation. The U.S. doesn't really have many mass shootings at all. It's really just a load of media hype to sell newspapers and sell stories and let politicians like David Shoebridge from the Greens you know, flout his ego and say that Australia is great. Oh, we don't yeah. see, tend, to, tend to see people, uh, ordinary people from America talking about how they, they always fear going to the shops because there, there might be uh, a mass shooting. It, it just uh, Ordinary Americans, they just seem to, uh, it, it, they don't really have that fear, fear as in, like I know, uh, 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 former Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher said we need uh, travel warnings to America uh, because our Tim, citizens... Tim, Tim Fisher Tim Fisher's a cuck. Like, <laughs> like, him and John Howard are both like massive cucks. So that's all I'll say on them. Um, but on the record, I am saying that both of you are just massive political cuckolds. Please never, ever speak on air again. Um, <laughs> now... Another thing that I didn't mention before was the fact that all these mass shootings seem to have, or shootings that do happen, that are, uh, are generally not involved in gang violence, generally happen in lots of places that also happen to be, surprise, surprise, gun-free zones. Like, for example, 
bars, malls, schools, and you'll find that some schools, some bars and some malls have now passed laws, or they haven't passed the laws, obviously, but they have chosen to drop their, their policy. And, yeah, there aren't really any issues. I mean, when was the last time you heard of a mass shooting happening at a gun show? It, yeah, it, no. It doesn't, doesn't happen. It, 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 so, it, sounds, uh, it sounds very implausible. <laughs> yeah, well, they could try, but they'd 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 die. Which and you know, and going back to the second part of that question, do you so do you think a good guy with a gun can stop uh, some sort of um, mass shooting? Do you think that's possible? Absolutely, we saw it recently in New South Wales with the unfortunate death of um, Curtis Cheng. Yeah, uh, the man who actually shot him was a special constable. Um, I don't know necessarily what that sort of means in terms of full-time, part-time, whether he's... Anyway, he was a member of the police force and he was a good guy. He did have a gun. He was there at the right time and he did put the put the threat down. Now, imagine for a second that he wasn't there and this kid was just going to go around and keep shooting people. Yeah. Who, who would have stopped him? I mean, like how many more people would have had to die? Now, let's say, for example... There was a guy who's, you know, had his gun license. He's got his handgun license. Uh, he attends a minimum number of shoots per calendar month to sort of get his competency up and make sure that he makes the right decisions. And he happens to be legally carrying his handgun. He would have been in the same position. He would have put the threat down just the same way as the police officer did. So... Just because you wear a uniform doesn't mean you're going to be there all the time. Um, so, but we don't we don't have concealed carry or anything like that. That'd be that'd be far too far too uh, politically politically bad for any party to sort of consider. Except the LDP. I mean, they do it all the time, which is good. Yeah, Tim loves the LDP. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh. they are quite popular. They are quite popular with firearm owners. Generally, the split is between the LDP and the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. So, But they, they generally split on other policies as well. But, you know, each to their own. Both parties seem to do a good job at representing their people. We have some fantastic uh, Shooters and Fishers and Farmers MPs down here in Victoria, uh, Jeff and Dan. And they do a fantastic job. So it'll be great to see more of those kind of politicians out there in the future. Yeah, it's it's definitely good that there are at least uh, some uh, electoral options for for shooters in Australia, even if the the major parties ignore them as a as a constituency. Which which brings us to uh, our our next question. So we've talked about uh, firearms for for most of this interview, and also I've yeah like to, like to thank you for busting some of the the myths for us, and also. Uh, edu That's all right. educating us on some of the more technical aspect of firearms, which we're not across. Um, but it's sort of, or this, yep. well, I'm going to talk about America again, which is probably a bad thing to do, but it's, it's always seen as uh, the, the left uh, are pro-gun control and the right uh, <laughs> are for... Uh, uh, for guns, so sort of, where do you sort of sit on the political spectrum? Like, do you have other political views, or do you just sort of mainly stick to sort of uh, firearm issues? I, d I tend to stick to firearm issues, but I'm not really a fan of people who like controlling uh, the little guy based on politics of fear. So you know, there are a lot of parties that I like, and there are some parties I like more than others. Um, I try and be in my role right now, pretty critical when it comes to that. But I will say that I'm not a fan of the Australian Greens. I'm not a fan of Liberal, <laughs> and I'm not a fan of Labor. That's, That's good. With the Greens. So, yeah. Well, we could all agree. Um, we could we all can. agree on that. But yeah. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. There are some European Green parties that actually are well, not necessarily pro-gun, but they're not anti-gun. Oh, they wow. understand that. They understand that. You know, hunting is a cultural thing, and it's 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 part of nature. And obviously, to ensure you're doing the ethical thing, you need a firearm. So, it's very interesting to see that. Obviously, our greens are actually red on the inside. So, oh yes, yes they are. <laughs> we can't really, uh, you know, we can't really compare the pair. But 
you know, apple to oranges, watermelons to watermelons, I guess. <laughs> have you have you actually met a, a, pro, a progressive or left wing person who was pro gun? I have actually met uh, a couple of communists who are pro gun. Um, oh, okay. A couple oh. of Marxists, well, they which need, seems they which which a lot of people. Well, yep, well that's yeah. the thing. You'll find that uh, Karl Marx, um, you know, forgive yeah, me for saying his name. I almost feel like I should start autistically screeching right now. But anyway, <laughs> um, anyway, Karl Marx is actually incredibly pro-gun. Um, he's got some quotes on his thoughts on private firearm ownership, uh, namely like, you know, all efforts must be frustrated to um, all efforts for the state to take away the workers' guns must be frustrated by force if necessary. I, I, I've, I've, I've absolutely butchered the quote, but it is out there. So, you know, it's not it's not that uncommon to find there are people from all over the political spectrum who do like firearms. Um, now, they might only like a certain type of firearm and not believe that everyone should have a certain type of firearm. But, you know, that's sort of what we're here for. We're here to sort of say, look, you might not think that you don't need it, but there might be someone else who might want it. I mean, it, it doesn't harm you. It doesn't harm society. Give it a break. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing is, the left tries to... I mean, the left is totali totalitarian, ultimately. I mean, they want to um, sort of control people because they want to feel good, um, because they think they know what's best for everyone, that sort of thing, um, which which <laughs> has an impact on people's freedom, and you know, it has an impact on people's sort of freedom to actually own guns and be able to defend themselves. Yeah, absolutely. But then again, there are there are certain parties who are against that. Um, from the other side of the political spectrum as well. Actually, true, that's, that's true. That's, that's, true. That's, not, that's actually not entirely true. Um, if we look at Australia First, for, uh, for example, who are probably the most right-leaning party in the entire country, they're actually all incredibly pro-firearm. They believe that everyone should be allowed to own a firearm. Uh, obviously, if you're, if you're a criminal, you can't, because yeah. even, if, even in the US, if you're a felon, if you've gone to jail or you know, you've got a mark against your name, um, you're not allowed to own a gun either. So... Yeah, it's yeah. Um, yeah. it is interesting to see which parties support firearm ownership and which parties don't. But I guess that does come come down to ideology and politics. Yeah. So in the, at the end of the day, like it, it generally is politics that's the main deciding factor on these things. Uh, we have uh, two two of our contributors to to the Unshackled are uh, members of the the United Conservative Party, which is new political party, which is um, was actually on their first page about an hour ago. Yeah, so they're they're pro pro firearm as well. So uh, yeah, we 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 should we should give them a plug as well, shouldn't we, Sukas? We should, yeah. I mean, it's great to see more and more people who are coming out as conservatives and coming out as pro-gun and coming out as people who sort of appreciate our culture and heritage, um, which I think contributes to your um, efforts at making sure there aren't much, there isn't much gun control, right, James? That's right. Yeah. Um, th thank you so much for coming today. Um, it was right. really, it was because uh, it was really nice to sort of listen to like specific um technical things about guns and you know it was really interesting um now this is this interview is available on itunes stitcher um and some other uh, uh, tune uh, in methods radio, yeah. and it'll be on yeah. our on our youtube uh, uh channel as well that's yeah, awesome. tim, is, tim is the technical person in the in the in the group so um yeah thank you for coming and, thank you and, james again and, and good that's luck that's quite all right thank you for having me and good luck with firearm owners uh, united for the future. Uh, we're, we're both uh, big fans, and we certainly hope that yeah you can continue uh, lobbying and uh, get into the media, and of course yeah get more get more Facebook fans as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, if you guys are interested in um, if you haven't shot before, if you're interested in getting a license, just hit me up. I'll be happy to either sort someone out to take you shooting or take you myself and go through the process. And if you want any more, if you want any more um, further technical information, we have a big database of facts on our website, which I'll link to you guys uh, later on. Yes. Yep. We will um, have the actual link um, in the description, um, so that so that you can visit um, James's website. Um, again, thank you, James, for coming, and we'll we'll be back. Tim and I will be back on Tuesday with another episode, um, and next Thursday with another interview episode. Thanks again. 
Thank you for listening. And thank you again, James. No worries. Thanks a lot. Bye.